class of the day. Welcome. I'm happy to introduce Leandra, Leandra Pretzel, from 350.org, which probably most of you know. And Leandra has been working on the um, fossil free divestment campaign. And this masterclass is about how to build a decentralized campaign or network. And um, so, I'm, so I'm sure from fo Fossil Free and 350.org, you have a lot of good tips on, on how to do that. Leander works in Germany, in Münster. And I just wanted to, well, you can tell a little bit more about yourself as you go on. That's better, you, you know better than I do. <laughs> so thanks, Leandra, and hand over to you. Again, as the, before, it's being put on film, so if you want to ask a question or say something, please wait for the microphone to come. Yeah, thank you uh, for the introduction and the invitation, and welcome to the masterclass about divestment and how to establish a decentralized network of um, campaign groups. So what I want to do in this masterclass is that I would just um, yeah, introduce the campaign and uh, tell you a bit about our networking strategies. And afterwards, I would open yeah, room for discussion and questions. And then we will see if we still have time left. We could get a bit more active and um, go into some group work so that you can yeah, develop some of your own ideas. So um, yeah, my name is Leandra Pretzel. I'm living in Münster. That's a city in the... Yeah, northwest of Germany and I'm an activist with the fossil free campaign since 2013 and since yeah more or less two and a half years now I'm yeah doing some trainings and workshops for other German campaign groups just if they need support uh, with developing their campaigns strategies and or communications whatever um, they need, so we uh, try to support them with that and um, giving them workshops and trainings. So um, before I start, I want to ask you a question. So who of you has a bank account? Just raise your hand. <laughs> who does not have a bank account? <laughs> so um, is anybody having any funds or trusts? Oh, okay. So and... Um, did you ever think about, or do you maybe know what your bank is doing with that money that, that's on your bank account? Yeah? Or even savings accounts, right? Yeah, just yeah. normal. So, you want to comment on that? Anyone want to say <laughs> something about that? What your wonderful bank is doing with all of your money? <laughs> Ashley? I just, uh, I know from campaigns like yours, and I have a bank account with a building society so it only invests in kind of properties and houses rather than in fossil investments. So all the others who don't know what their bank is doing with their money so what would you say if I told you your bank is investing in a company that is doing arms trade what would you think? Would you be like really angry or would you just say I don't care what they are doing or what would you say if this um, your bank is supporting companies that are investing in or supporting child labor. Would you be happy with that? <laughs> <laughs> or um, what would you say if this bank uh, is supporting companies which burn and extract coal, oil and gas and therefore like um, change the climate? So, um, yeah, this is an issue that we are addressing with our divestment campaign. But um, before I start to explain what it is about, I want to do some team building with you because this is also a very important part of our yeah, um, strategies and networking and um, empowerment. So um, the game is called Who Else? So um, I would maybe not everybody because we are quite many people, but who wants, um, who can just stand up and say, anything, what you like, what you don't like, where you have been to. So, and if this um, is the same for you, you just can stand up and if it's not right for you, you can just uh, sit down. So, 
I can just start with a simple thing. I would say, like, my favorite color is green. So who else's favorite color is green? Who could just stand up? OK, so anybody else who wants to say something? <laughs> about what? things you like, you don't like, that are somehow important for you, your favorite hobbies, whatever. Um, I like to watch films. So I love to watch films. So everybody films, who watched really films, just stand up. <laughs> <laughs> films. films, films, movies, movies. Yeah. Uh, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm alone. <laughs> uh, I also like cycling to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Dutch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I get inspired by the things I've heard today. Uh, I'm from uh, Canada. I know I'm a pro. Oh, you got wonder. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, one last person. Maybe we can go on. One, I, I, I love trees. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So we know a bit about each other, what we have in common, what we don't have in common, maybe what that some people have very like special things that are yeah, difficult for them, that they are that are unique for them. So you see like um, a group can, can be very diverse or can be very like, can have things in common. So it really depends. Okay, so now back to the divestment. What is divestment? So divestment is the opposite of investment. That means that uh, people or institutions are taking out their money from companies that are having business practices that are like ethically or morally just not accepted or wrong. So, um, yeah, one important thing about the um, divestment is that it's um, happening publicly. So the people or the institution that is divesting has to admit it publicly so that everybody knows it. So where does it actually come from? So this is not the first divestment campaign, the fossil fuel divestment campaign. Um, there have been other campaigns before, for example, the campaign against the apartheid regime in South Africa. Um, so this is kind of our role model that we, um, we are adapting and now shifting it to fossil fuel companies. So it's a campaign of the US American NGO 350.org. Maybe some of you heard of it before. Um, it has some other campaigns, um, for example, right now uh, against big pipelines in the US, like the Keystone XXL or the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and it was founded by Bill McKibben. He's a climate activist and he also won the Alternative Nobel Prize in 2014. And yeah, he's really engaged and he's quite famous and he's a really cool guy. If you have seen some talks of him, it's really, really ins inspiring. Um, yeah, and on this map you can see like how um, the fossil free campaign is spread all over the globe. So as it comes from the United States, most of the campaigns are in the United States, but we also have many campaigns uh, now in Europe and some also in Australia and Japan, um, Philippines, New Zealand and uh, also South Africa. So um, the fossil free campaign has an enemy, and this enemy is the fossil fuel um, industry. Why? Because it's burning coal, oil, and gas, and therefore um, changing the climate, and it's making profit with it. So we say that if it's wrong to wreck the climate, it's also pro uh, wrong to profit from that wreckage, and that's why we want to fight the fossil fuel industry. So um, why is it so important? 
because you probably all know the Paris Agreement that was accepted in um, December 2015 at the COP21. And there all the nations, um, they agreed to limit, um, to keep climate change below um, 1.5 to 2 degrees. So that means that nearly all the carbon reserves that we know have to stay in the ground, to stay below these 1.5 or 2 degrees. But the problem is that there are far more reserves um, in the ground and that if we would burn all these reserves, we would maybe have a like um, global warming around 4 or 5 degrees or even more, nobody knows. And this would mean that yeah, a lot of parts of this planet would not be possible to live there anymore and yeah, especially for the poorest uh, in this world who are also the least responsible for this climate change, yeah, they will be most effective. So this is like not only stupid, but a really, really unfair situation. So we have this um, moral argument of the, um, for the campaign, the climate crisis, the climate change, but we also have a financial argument. So what you can see here, we call the carbon bubble. And the black one, that is um, like the known carbon reserves that are underground. And these are nearly 2.8 billion tons of CO2. So now if we want to um, reach these two degree um, or stay below the two degrees limit, 80% of these reserves have to stay in the ground. But the fossil fuel industry plans to burn like 100%. But now if you, um, we ho all hope that all these treaties that we made, that they will, um, that they will, yeah, um, will be fulfilled. So um, the fossil fuel companies, they will lose all these investments, all the money of these 80% of unburnable carbon that has to stay in the ground and so they will lose a lot of money and this bubble will just burst. So um, yeah, to just conclude it, we have uh, this idea of the campaign that the fossil fuel um, industry is the climate killer number one. And uh, now um, we need a target for this campaign. And the target of our campaign are public institutions, institutions like churches, like municipalities, universities, also pension funds, um, all um, yeah, institutions that um, yeah, are um, having money, that um, are having this money from your taxes and that are investing this money somehow because they don't just keep it under the pillow. Um, and also we think that um, as they are public institutions, they have to fulfill a social duty to not uh, just destroy the planet, but do good for the people. So um, we demand them, like really clearly demand them to stop all investments in the at least top 200 coal, oil and gas companies. So we have a list of the top uh, 200 companies, which means these are the companies that have the largest carbon reserves. And um, these uh, institutions, they, like, they get a time span of five years to um, divest this money and reinvest it somewhere else. So in our campaign, we have three main goals. So the first goal is that we want to build up this um, global decentralized network of campaign groups and that these campaign groups are um, autonom autonomously um, demanding divestment from their institutions and um, yeah, in the best case to do it uh, in a public way and um, do it in a really like creative way. Mm. The second goal is that we want to withdraw the fossil fuel industry social license. So that means that we just want to destroy their image. We want that people think, okay, they are really bad. It's not good that they are making profit with changing and destroying the climate and the planet. Um, and the third thing is um, that we just, in general, want to um, stimulate the discussion about climate change and the, that we want to be at a central part of the public debate and that everybody knows what ch climate change means, what it is, where it leads to, and um, yeah, just raise awareness about that issue. So in the end, this should lead like to a new social norm and to also new and restrictive legislation. So, um, that it's, for example, not allowed anymore to burn that carbon that the 
fossil fuel companies they have to change their business practice um, that yeah and that they are um, losing their influence on so many um, yeah things in our life so now I would come to the second part of the pr presentation so how did we manage or how are we still trying to manage to build up this decentralized grassroots movement so I think um, there are three main points that are like really, really important for the campaign and that are also yeah, maybe unique for the campaign. Um, the first one is that it's, as I already said, it's decentralized. So it's spread all over the planet and um, yeah, it's, it's worldwide. It's not like in a national context, but it's just spread all, all over all continents. Um, the second uh, very important thing is that um, every group can um, apply it to their own special context. So for example, if you're a group of students and you're studying at a university, you could just address your univers university. Or if, you're, if there's a, for example, group of uh, believers, they could just address their parish and ask them to do um, divestment. And um, this is really strong because um, people can, who somehow feel connected to their institutions uh, just makes it stronger and they get more engaged and they get more, do more commitment um, to demand this um, divestment from their institutions. So yeah, it's like really emotional and uh, tightening process and uh, idea and f of this connection to these institutions. And um, the third thing is um, that we have all in common is the clear demand that we say, okay, take your money out of fossil fuel companies. And that's the same and clear and everybody understands it and it's a goal and it can be reached or it can be not reached. So um, behind that we have um, different organizing principles. Uh, in total four that we also call our divestment DNA, so to say, and we try to share it um, yeah, within our work and also um, to the people and to the um, grassroots groups. Um, the first thing is um, that we try uh, to rebuild any hierarchy and that the groups can work um, very autonomously. So they can do their own decisions on how to develop their strategy, which tactics to use, how to do communications, how to do um, actions, like um, how creative they want to be. Um, so this is all their own choice. They don't, um, nobody has to say, okay, uh, you're allowed to do that or you're not. They can just do whatever they think is right. And of course, um, we support them with material and tools and methods. But um, yeah, I will tell uh, more about that later. Um, then secondly, it's um, yeah, open for all and uh, inclusive. So. We try to keep the barriers for engagement like as low as possible. I mean, that's of course a very hard task, but we're trying to do. So it really does no doesn't matter which background you have, where you come from, um, which religion you belong to, which gender you have, which sexual orientation you have. We um, try to be all inclusive, and it's also really important to deliver that message when we are giving, for example, workshops. So we are always trying to be very open and try that everybody just feels comfortable within the group. Um, third thing that we are um, doing is being open source. So all the materials we have are free in the internet. We have a lot of resources on our website. Um, yeah, we have um, methods for workshops. Um, I will give some examples of that later. Um, and um, yeah, the last thing is, that it's really important to take action. So, um, of course, it's nonviolent action, um, but it's a really important thing to escalate the campaigns and to raise the public awareness and just to go out to the streets and yeah, do some actions and say, hello, here we are, and um, we have a demand. So, um, besides that, of course, we are using a lot of online communication, uh, a lot of Facebook, a lot of Twitter, we're having mailing lists, we're having regular newsletters um, with um, action calls, with just uh, news developments about the campaign. 
Um, we're giving webinars where everybody could attend to, so it's like a workshop, but just online. And we have a communication platform that's called Slack. It's you can do different things there. You can just have chats. You can have like uh, greater forums for discussion. You can exchange materials. So um, this is the thing we started now to just easier exchange ideas. Ideas. So some more details about um, yeah how we are trying to connect all these people and keep the network uh, going. As I already said, um, yeah, we share open resources. So what you can see here is our workshops homepage. So it's a page where you can find a lot of methods that we are also using in our own workshops for, for example, group facilitation, for campaign strategy, for organizing, for doing communications work. And you can find all the methods um, you can find there and you can just download them and yeah, um, just apply them to your own context, use them in your own groups, be a, like a workshop trainer or facilitator yourself. And it's also it's available in different languages, as you can see above. So another thing, maybe you already uh, realized that I have this weird font and a lot of black and orange in my presentation. So this is one part of our common language and design. So yeah, we're sharing uh, some kind of a style guide where we just um, yeah, propose which colors to use, which types and fonts to use, and we have a lot of logos uh, for download also on the internet so that you can just um, yeah, apply to your own presentations, to your own flyers, whatever you are designing. So this is just the idea to, yeah, to create a common like integrity to to just feel as ones and to yeah, um, make the people stick together and create some kind of an identity. So um, we're also having many workshops and gatherings. So I already told you that, I, that I'm giving workshops in Germany. Um, this is only on demand. If groups uh, would like to have it, then we, we just give them workshops. And then we also have like greater gatherings, like every one to two years on a national level or also on a European level. So there are just meet a lot of uh, people from different countries, from different um, campaigns, and we can just meet and exchange and develop ideas. And this is also a very empowering and motivating moment to just see that there are a lot of other people fighting for the same goal, having, facing the same problems, and so you can really motivate each other, and it's always really cool days if we just meet and having workshops and talking about, uh, talking with each other. So another thing that we do to try to like um, grow this identity is um, yeah, organizing global days of action. So in 2014, we had a global divestment day and we're trying to do this again in May this year. It's the global divestment mobilization. So one week long, uh, groups from all over the world, they can just invent their own creative um, action to support the divestment idea. So and this is also creating like a like great momentum for the campaign and um, also creating a like quite great public awareness. Mm. I told you before that um, it's like really um, important that the divestment campaign is applicable to your own context. So I want to give you two examples. And the first example is um, the church. So now there's a growing um, movement um, about divesting the church. So there's a campaign, um, Divest the Vatican, for example, and also since the Pope has uh, published his encyclica, all this idea of environmental and climate uh, protection has become more popular within the Catholic Church. And I think, um, yeah, like, um, faith and uh, climate protection, like, goes very well together. And so, um, yeah, we hope that this will develop soon and that uh, it will work out because also the church has a lot of money. I mean, especially in Germany, it has much more money than all other public institutions. So, yeah, this is one, one really important thing. Another thing that I want to show you is um, a campaign that we have here in Germany in North Rhine-Westphalia. It's a federal state of Germany. It's called 
in German raus aus RWE or like in English I would just translate it out of WRE, no, RWE. So this is a um, coal company, German coal company who's extracting um, coal in Germany and burning it. And it's also one of these top 200 coal companies that I told you before. And it's one of the biggest CO2 emitters uh, in Europe. So um, there's a special thing about RWE and uh, municipalities in North Rhine-Westphalia because they are really tightly bound together. So the municipalities, they um, have a lot of shares on RWE. This is a historical development that I now won't explain. But um, now we have a lot of groups in Germany who just uh, demand from the municipalities to sell their RWE shares. Um, yeah, and you can see here um, we did some creative actions at a RWE um, gathering in Essen this year. So last but not least, what is also really important for the campaign that a no from an institution means thanks to the campaign. So if your institution, for example, your university says, no, we won't divest, then it's not like, okay, you should say, we lost, the fight, is, uh, the fight is over, we can go home. But it's an opportunity to escalate the campaign and to, to do actions. For example, you can see on the right here, these are students in, of the University of Edinburgh. And yeah, the president said no to divestment and then they just occupied his office. Leandra, do you, these workshops and trainings that you do, are they mostly, do they focus mostly on building the campaigns and the awareness raising, or do you also, does 350.org also give um, in, instructions and training on how you approach these institutions, you know, how you would approach a, a municipality or a university or a pension fund, and, you know, what kind of alternatives, um, you know, how you work with them to um, get them to mm. finally agree? Yeah, there are many different ways. I mean, we... Um, we are orientated uh, on the needs of the group. So if the group says, okay, we need, to, we need a workshop on lobbying and how to address like politicians or any decision makers, we would do that. If they said like, we want to learn about media communications, we would do that. So there's a really broad range of um, topics that we, that we have and then we try to help them. So yeah, it's really diverse. The left side is uh, an action of the Berlin Fossil Free Group They, uh, in front of the town hall. Um, yeah, Just two examples of how you can get creative with your activism. So, no? um, I put this slide because um, many people and many institutions are asking us, okay, now I divested my money from coal, oil and gas, but what to do now? Because there's nothing else that's profitable. That's like one of the main uh, things that they are telling us. Um, but that's really not right. Um, the first thing is that the higher the demand, the more of these, for example, fossil-free funds will develop. And um, you can now see that in the last uh, years and months, there have become more and more funds that are fossil-free, for example. Um, and then, um, if you want to know more about it, we. We have on our um, web page, we have some examples about um, yeah, like fossil free investments and also the German NGO Brot für die Welt, like Bread for the World. They also made a list of uh, these fossil free and ethical, like okay investments. Um, yeah, and alternatively, um, you could also like invest in local projects. For example, in Germany, we have a lot of these citizens' wind parks. So this is another very profitable opportunity where municipalities, for example, could invest their money in. Yep. Okay. So uh, to finish my presentation, um, just to show you that we also have some famous supporters. Um, I'm really sorry that now there are only men on the slide. I just realized that this morning when I clicked through it and I was like, oh no, <laughs> because normally I always want to pay attention on that, but yeah, this is how you sometimes cannot fulfill your own requirements. So this just happens. Um, so this, on the right, you can see Desmond Tutu, an archbishop from South Africa, who's one of the first persons who really stood up for divestment. 
Um, then here on the lower part, you can see Ban Ki-moon, and this is uh, Joachim Schellenhuber. He's a climate scientist, one of, he also participated in the IPCC, and um, here yeah, he's um, the director of a very famous German climate research institute called PIC. Um, and maybe the most uh, famous one is Leonardo DiCaprio, who's yeah, like really supporting the divestment campaign and who divested himself. Um, he has a foundation which he divested. And yeah, to end the presentation, some good news on how the divestment campaign has uh, been successful so far. So until now, there are 700 institutions worldwide which divested $5.5 trillion. And most of these institutions are faith-based institutions, and they are followed by foundations. And like other public institutions or NGOs, they are like the smaller part. So yeah, like religious institutions are really like, yeah, at the forefront. So, and here are some more or less famous institutions who divested. For example, the University of Glasgow, the Rockefeller Fund, who made their uh, money with coal, oil, and gas some hundred years ago, which I found really uh, astonishing. Then the Norwegian Pension Fund, one of the, or the biggest pension fund in the world, who divested only from coal, but at least the first step. And yeah, the World Council of Churches, the British Med Medical Association, so quite big institutions who said, okay, we will not invest in coal, oil, and gas anymore. So, yeah, we are already succeeding, and, um, yeah, the movement is growing, but uh, I think there's still a lot to do, and um, we won't give up the fight, and we will fight on, and just until all the coal, oil, and gas uh, will stay in the ground. Yeah, so thanks for your attention, and if you have any questions, if you want to give some points for discussion, you can go ahead. Um, well, uh, very good and great. Um, as you are just mentioning, the pension fund in uh, Scandinavia, also Allianz uh, has done a similar. Have you been involved in convincing those take Allianz and this investment fund uh, to do that? Or did they do it for other reasons and now you can use it in order to convince others? Um, I think that it's just like, I mean, it was Hen not the, for, if you mean that it was not the campaigners of fossil free who went there and said divest and then they divested. I think it's just like a general movement that uh, people are realizing um, it's a financial risk to uh, invest mm -hmm. in coal and gas. I mean, they didn't do it because they want to save the climate. You, they just did it for economic for reasons. Economic reasons yes. So this, this is growing and what we still are working on is saying that don't do it because of the climate and not of the money. I mean, you mm -hmm. still have to remember that. And I think the fossil free campaign was one part uh, of that um, development. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it was not me personally or my colleagues who just went there and said, let's do it. <laughs> and do you also... <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you also liaise, for example, with Munich Re? Because they are doing a lot of work uh, to really link the CO2 with the weather extremes and an end, because that could be also an important help uh, to convince others uh, to follow that. Uh, have you been engaged in that? Hmm? Münchner Rück. The Rückversicherung. Ah, uh, no. Because that would be an, an important... Uh, that's, that's new to me. Okay, so yeah. that, that might be uh, one possibility uh, to use existing strengths yeah. Uh, yeah, in order yeah. to get more support uh, yeah, for I your, will, for your idea. Research on that. And uh, if, if I may just uh, be... Uh, the, the little devil advocate for a moment. Uh, so I totally agree with all what you said, but uh, how do you argue with people who are denying the climate change by CO2 by saying, well, CO2 is only 5%, mainly is water vapor, and uh, so all these uh, things. Uh, how do you, in, in three sentences, mm -hmm. how do you react on them? Um, I think that's a really hard question because me personally, I think that you cannot, cannot convince these people. And so far, within my experience, I only met like decision makers who are accepting the fact of human-made climate change, but who are saying we cannot, it's not like our work to divest our money, but we are doing other things. Or we don't have money. It's, they are finding excuses, but so far nobody has told me climate change doesn't exist. 
And I think that, of course, it's a threat to like the whole movement, but I think that these people, they are not the important ones. The important ones are those who are already on your side or who are like, hmm, I'm not sure. So it's easier to convince them. So of course, it's, it's bad if you meet, if you meet these opinions, but um, I think, I, I personally don't know how to convince them. I mean, you convince them with facts, but that doesn't work. And you can try to convince them with emotions, but normally pff, they but just don't care because maybe they are just interested in making money, so. But they're going yeah. to have stranded assets whether they believe in climate change or not, so. That's not going to, that's, that's can, not going to change can, their financial risk. You can come risk. with a financial argument, of course. But then still some people say, oh, all these, um, all these um, things, they are not true, they just, uh, yeah. Um, I was a bit, little bit troubled when you mentioned um, or throwing people working in a coal-fired power plant with supporters of child labor into one bucket. Yeah, I don't know whether that's the right approach uh, to really say these are the enemies. I think um, the power industry, of course, uh, you, I would agree that we will not shut off power plants tonight at six o'clock. Yeah, uh, that would not be a solution to the problem. Yeah, we have to go through a time of decades where we have to drive down power plants. They have to become more flexible. Uh, they have to have tremendous problems with like in. Uh, not in Westphalia, with their people, workforces, uh, they have to restructure. So I don't know really whether it's so helpful to really put up here an enemy situation. I think we, we certainly have to work together. I know a lot of people uh, working in that industry, uh, many of them working hard to really contribute to the solution and building up here a scenery where say these are the enemies and these are the bad people, we are the good people. That's just something I'm not very comfortable with. Uh, second, with the divestment um, idea uh, also, um, I certainly, don't get me wrong, I, don't, I also want to get out of fossil fuels, of course, um, but with the divestment, I think you have to um, differentiate between uh, investment through funds, so if it's anonymously, so if you don't know really what, your, what happens with your money, uh, you only say, I want back as much as possible. For example, if a community in Northern Westphalia, if they invest in a local power plant, and they, if they have their shares, they, they also sit in the company. They have something to say. They can influence on the way it's, so it's going. I think that can be absolutely a positive uh, investment. So if, if people who are involved, they have the control, by then they're getting democratic uh, challenge because a, a certain mayor could be voted and they, he might support closing down that power plant. So I really, I, I just won't, wouldn't simplify it and say everything out and fine, and they are the bad guys, we're the good guys. I think that gives the wrong impression. Yeah, maybe if I may react on this. Um, I hope to remember everything. So, um, of course, you're right, there could be an inf a positive influence, but I think the reality just nowadays is just the opposite. The companies are influencing the politicians with just giving them money. So. And I don't, I don't see it the other way around. I'm just not realizing that it's happening. And then, of course, you're right. We just, we won't shut all the power plants tomorrow. But there needs to be a phase out. But still, it is like possible to have a radical change in your economic system. If you just think about World War II, they changed the whole economic system to uh, the construction of weapons in, I don't know, maybe one, one or two years. And the third thing, well. Um, Oh, yeah. uh, I wanted to say that uh, divestment also like intends to, I said, like destroying the image. And I think through that, um, to rebuild the image, these companies, um, they would um, like change their business practice and maybe it would accelerate um, the um, invention, for example, of new technologies and where they're putting their money and if they're putting it into coal power plants or if they're putting it into renewable energy. So I think this could also help like change the transition of these companies. They already know they are dying companies. They yes, of course. People, I think. I don't know. <laughs> she, she will Thank you. Well, I think we, it's absolutely right. We shouldn't see the carbon industry uh, as an enemy. At least the person, the managers in charge, they did it in good faith. 
but they just cho were choosing the wrong, wrong uh, direction. Uh, we should accept that there is a time needed for div divestment. It cannot be done from today to tomorrow. But the good thing, it's underway. In Switzerland, there were in the recent uh, three months were various big, very big articles in various newspapers uh, recommending divestment from uh, carbon industry uh, because of uh, rentability, not because of ec eco ecology, just because of economy. So it is, they were recommending to get out of this uh, of this uh, stocks. Now, uh, carbon, the, the um, climate change is a very terrible thing, but the very good thing about climate change is that it is slow. It's very slow. And we still have time to do it in paces, uh, in constant paces, and uh, I think the future generation is uh, really the one who will be very, very hit, much hit by the problem. So. I think it's very important to address children and to invent games, video games, which attract children about this problem. Well, I'm just the moderator, but I would say climate change is anything but slow, <laughs> but whatever. Um, you're right. I mean, divestment couldn't be um, just be done from one day to another, but this is also like included in our demands. We give the institutions five years of time to fulfill the requirements, so they just don't have to do it within one week or so. They have some time to do it and just uh, yeah, rethink their, their, um, their investments. Um, yeah, that's yeah. all. <laughs> I, I'm, I spoke to the, a member of the board of uh, Rockefeller Brothers Fund who was when they were doing that divestment, or after they made the decision, and he said it took years. Of, I mean, working with boards is difficult on any issue, but on something like that, and he said it took really a long, long time. And as you said, it's not gonna happen tomorrow. They, they don't say we're divesting, and so all the money is taken out, right? It has to go you know, slowly, uh, step by step. Thanks. Just yeah, just to follow on from that. Obviously, it's quite a complex process, and I'm wondering to what extent does fossil free and maybe this isn't in the purview of the campaign, but I'm really thinking that like a very coordinated strategic plan of engaging actual institutions and firms and presenting them with like the least risk way of divesting and also reinvesting in a way to you know inc improve their financial sustainability that would be really valuable. And I don't know. I think for a lot of larger firms, they probably have in-house like team, teams that can work on that, but for smaller firms, they probably just don't have the capacity in many ways to actually think about strategic ways to mitigate um, the negative consequences of divestment for their, for their shareholders and things like that, and then to reinvest. And so maybe that's not the purpose of Fossil Free, but I think that might be a missing piece that's really needed for firms in order to enable them to reinvest in a strategic way. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's why, why I put this slide and that I said that we're now also working on these reinvestment strategies and um, that there are also many other um, organizations who are working on that. And um, yeah, of course, that's an important thing and that's really difficult to do. Um, yeah, but uh, I think, as I said, like these, um, like, for example, funds, they are growing and I think there will be more and more in the future. So maybe this problem will solve it a little bit by itself. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I think it's really cool to say I have followed you like 350 for a long time and this is like the first time I actually hear you. But um, I, I wanted to uh, ask you something regarding the, the, the decentralization you, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Like in, in your real experience, how do you cope with the problems that come with decentralization? So for example, the fact that reaching a consensus is something that in many contexts is really difficult w within a group even of 10, 20, 30 people. And for example, uh, other or other type of, you can say, logistic problems that comes with decentralization. But how, 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 could, how do you work with the groups mm. regarding these this issues? Um, so um, like the logistic uh, problems, I think they are can quite easily be solved as we are doing, we're so well connected with, by the internet and by telephone and everything. So um, I don't know if I mentioned it, that we're having like regular 
Skype um, meetings, for example, for the German campaign. So once a month, we're just um, yeah meeting, and everybody who uh, is interested could join and just exchange their experiences and yeah, give tips for other groups. Um, and then for the decision making, um, this is also. I mean, there has not to be so much decision making between the groups because all the campaigns they are so autonomous that it's just not necessary that that you have to like um, discuss your campaign with another group. Of course, you um, you have to discuss it within the groups. And then there are, like for example, on this workshops homepage, there's a lot of tools that you could use um, to yeah, have a fast decision making. Um, I don't know how the groups really do that, but from my group, I could tell that we're just, yeah, we're, for example, we're having, trying to have a moderation in every group meeting. Then uh, we're trying to discuss everything very detailed and we're discussing it just as long as everybody feels comfortable with the decision. So it might sometimes be quite long process, but I think it's worth it. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, then uh, thank you for your questions. And um, I have two small activities um, that we could do now. Maybe we could start with the first one because we, we, are, we still have half an hour, so maybe we could do both. So the first one is I would just ask you to go together in small groups, maybe just arrange yourself like you're sitting, maybe three to five people, and then just maybe think about three to five key elements that would make this um, like um, decentralized campaign successful. For, so what tools you could use, maybe also you remember some of those that I presented, that you could use to um, yeah, establish this um, network of campaign groups, maybe also from your own experiences. Um, yeah, and then we can just share the ideas, uh, see if we have anything in common. Maybe you already know, you have some experience, what worked out well, what didn't work out well. So I would say maybe we can do that for five to 10 minutes and then just get back and uh, collect some ideas. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, so everybody get up. <laughs> I, I thought you could, do, you could organize yourself, but then I will help you. <laughs> Uh, like people, three to five people in one group. So maybe we can do like one, two, three, four, five groups. So one group is here already. Then there's another group, another group is there, and another group in the back. Okay, then, I mean, you could stay where you are, or you can just, like, uh, spread somewhere in the room, or go outside if you need a quiet space. And then in 10 minutes, you can be back.
you might take over and that would kind of like yeah. why that yeah. you have you have some some organizations that say they're misused by some other interests or whatever. And I think that could be one side right. and and I, I I that 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 some people right. put that in put in people who do not know that it's yeah. really not that different because it's very hard to see because it's so anonymous. Okay, you don't know really who is behind certain things. So I think it, it could be problematic. It might be very effective um, in some cases, but yes, sometimes you don't maybe you need a power plant to say hire yeah, somebody. Yeah, and I, I'm concerned about the global yeah, 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 yeah,
one is a, one woman who initiated the all of that, and I don't know how to actually manage to to, to recruit the uh, and I'm not sure if that's something that I would want to do in terms of my uh, Another approach to centralize might be, and this is actually you know what I do, I, I work for the students, I work for the students to let a company, offline company, to carry the ideas to these other things, yeah, but they have to change and got to go for whatever, so instead of building up an opposition outside, but to really, to, to work with them, because we will find many people, that's what I mentioned to them, so they're not bad people, they want to change, they want to bring things that we do. We need that work, yeah? When you call signs were built, they were built 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, nobody, yeah. nobody thought that CO2 yeah. could be something harmful. Yeah. Maybe our scientists, but it was not really known at that time. Yeah, yeah. Let's say yeah. the 50s, 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 50